I'm John Golia. And I'm Greg Fife. And we are the, the Flight, Flight Safety, Safety Detectives. Detectives. We're just two guys who have spent most of their career with the National Transportation Safety Board investigating aircraft disasters and aviation safety issues all over the world. Yep, and this podcast is where we talk about everything from accidents, airplane technology, to the big business of aviation. We live and breathe aviation. My co-host, John, has been in the aviation business for more than 60 years. He was the first and only airframe and power plant mechanic to get a presidential appointment to the National Transportation Safety Board. And Greg is a former air safety investigator and GOAT team captain for the NTSB. He's investigated everything that flies worldwide since he started his career 40 years ago. And on top of that, he is a living legend of aviation inductee. So between John and myself, we have over 100 years of aviation safety experience. It's time to buckle up because it's going to be wheels up. Let's get this show in the air. Hello, John. It's another episode of Flight Safety Detectives, sponsored by PAMA and Avemco Insurance. Avemco has been a sponsor for Flight Safety Detective Show for some months now, and they've been in the insurance business for almost 60 years. They've been good to our listeners. If you just call and let them know that you listen to the show, they'll give you a 5% discount. So whether you're an owner, a renter, a CFI, or even a flying club, you can save a few dollars just by mentioning Flight Safety Detectives. And you can get to Avemco by either going online and punching in Avemco.com, or you can go to the 800 number, which is 888-879-0389. And if you mention Flight Safety Detectives again, you get a 5% discount. Well, Greg, what have you been up to lately? Well, as always, John, the work never ends. With the NTSB and the FAA not doing much as far as on-site acts investigation, I've got a lot of clients calling me saying they still want me to go out. So I've been traveling, been doing uh, a lot of good stuff as far as collecting information that really (laughs) we've identified some very interesting safety issues that once these uh, cases end up moving through whatever part of the litigation system they're going to move through. I want to use these as discussions on the podcast, but uh, I think the general aviation community that listens to our podcast is going to find uh, the issues very interesting and definitely beneficial with regard to not only flying a variety of different uh, aircraft that we're looking at, but some of the uh, the practical things. So, uh, yep, I'm staying busy, John. You know, never a dull moment other than uh, the fact that I'm dreaming that I was laying on a beach drinking little drinks and uh, with umbrellas in them and uh, enjoying life a little more. Well, I'll, I'll take the drink for you because I'm down close. <laughs> I'm, down, I'm down at the beach and I've been enjoying mojitos every day. Oh, yeah. Well, you know what? I love that kind of diet, a mojito diet. I like that. Yep. It's wonderful. It's wonderful. That's awesome. A couple of those and, uh, you know, nothing matters. Yep, absolutely. Well, you know, there's uh, there's a number of things going on um, besides the fact that uh, we're going to dedicate a bit of this show to our listeners and uh, talk about some of the great emails we've been receiving the last several months, we've picked uh, several of them to talk about. Uh, people have given us great suggestions. They've given us great feedback. You know, there's a couple of discussions in there that were prompted by questions. So we're going to to get to that. But, you know, I was reading some of the General Aviation Digest recently, and I ran across something that I sent to you because I read the abstract and I found it a little disconcerting with regard to a study that Embry-Riddle Aeronautical University, my alma mater, did. They did a study on gender and racial bias, and it was a very interesting synoptic. Uh, I would look forward to reading the entire study, but just the the headline basically was a new study released by researchers at Embry-Riddle Aeronautical University examined potential biases faced by aspiring female and minority commercial and student pilots in the United States. And as I was reading through the abstract, 
a couple of interesting things caught me. That's why I can't wait to read this study. It said specifically this study investigated consumer perceptions of gender and ethnic bias towards commercial airline pilots and flight students in the United States. In a two experiment design, participants in study one viewed pictures of current female and male commercial pilots of various races. Participants then rated their opinions on the quality of the pilot, that is professionalism, flight safety, smoothness of flight, and their confidence in the pilot. In study two, participants viewed pictures of student pilots and rated the individual's likeliness to succeed in flight training. The thing that just shocked me was the results, which is And I quote from their abstract, the results indicated that participants favored white male pilots in all conditions and that female and ethnic pilots were generally viewed as less favorable. I just I mean, I read that and I know that we've talked about racism in this country for decades. And of course, most recently, it has come up again. But I I just That's why I really need to see this study, John, because how do you determine one's professionalism or flight safety or smoothness of flight or even their confidence in a pilot by looking at pictures? I mean, I don't understand that. It it really defies description. I mean, were they really all professionally look pictures? You know, oh, did they have certain people... uh, not dress the pot. You know, the first thing that came to mind as I read that is is uh, some of the old TV programs where they had people portrayed as bums or drunks or whatever. Typical Hollywood type things. I don't see it. I mean, I don't see that. I mean, we've flown in this country. How many times have we had a whole crew of females? I've flown on a number of airplanes where the, the front end was, was all female and the back end was all female. I think they probably bid it that way because they're friends or whatever. But, I mean, I don't hear anybody complaining about that. I don't hear anybody, even derogatory remarks about that. It's become a non-event, I think. Yeah, I I mean, I went to college with a lot of women who aspired to be pilots. And, in fact, a lot of them are in the waning part of their careers as airline pilots, having flown for 20, 30, 35 years. And I know these women. I have all the confidence in the world in them because I know them. I know their work ethic. I know their the level of desire to be an airline pilot. I just don't know if I could tell that if I didn't know them by looking at their picture. Trust me, this whole COVID period, John, I mean, people see me on TV as they see you. We're typically wearing a tie, we've got a suit jacket on, we got our hair combed, and we kind of look the part of somebody that knows what they're talking about when it comes to safety in front of a, a TV camera. But I'll tell you what, you ask some of my friends who, you know, saw me kicking around with hunting gear on, long hair, you know, unshaven beard, goatee, you know, wearing a <laughs> a baseball hat or you know, a visor or whatever, people go, who the hell's that? You know, they, they would never believe that I'm a guy on TV who talks about aviation safety. So I'm not sure that there's got to be something more than just the pictures that these people, because how do you rate professionalism by someone's look? I Hell, I mean, I could dress up as a fireman you know, cut my hair and dress up as a fireman and look the part, but can I actually perform the part? Well, people aren't going to be able to tell that from a picture. Yeah, I I don't understand. I I don't even understand what the goal of the study was. It just says that these findings suggest that overt biases are present toward pilots with implications demonstrating that biases influence the hiring processes for female and minority pilots. And again, That finding doesn't make logical sense in just this abstract because you're not hiring people based on a look, especially from a picture. You're sitting them down. You're talking to them. You're asking them questions. When I was hiring investigators 
as a manager, as a supervisor at the NTSB. I mean, everybody came in with an impressive resume. And I would go through all the questions that I could ferret out, you know, their character and their integrity, who they were. But trying to figure out if they actually fit the dynamic of the rest of the investigators and myself in that office, I used to, you know, give my folks, I say, hey, take them out, pump them full of truth serum and find out who they really are. And that is, you know, find out what they're like outside of my office, just in the general population, in a very relaxed environment, and see if they're telling stories about how they flew inverted at night at 500 feet under a bridge, or are they the type of people that have each other's back, will step up when they need to, to cover for somebody, or work collectively with the group rather than trying to make a name for themselves as an individual. But that's a process. I, could, I couldn't tell that from a picture. Yeah, I, I just don't understand. I'll tell you, I've crossed paths with literally hundreds and hundreds of, of uh, pilots, uh, non-white pilots, non-male, non-white male pilots. And I mean, almost all of them were very professional. And I mean, in the corporate world, the 135 world, and the FBOs that I hang around in, I see them come in and out all the time. And they're the utmost in professionals. In fact, my little survey about walkarounds. Yeah. You know what? I'm, I'm just thinking right now that I can't remember a woman doing a lousy walk around. There may be some buried in there that I just don't remember. But I, I can't think of one just now, just sitting here. I can't think of one of the examples that I had of poorly performed walk, pre-flight walkarounds involving a woman. It always was a white male. Yeah, well, I'm going to give the study the benefit of the doubt because I've got to read it to really see maybe, you know, this abstract doesn't really present the best context for these findings. Because if they're just picking professionalism from pictures, trust me, you and I know a lot of people that kind of look professional in our business in a picture, but you and I know them too well and we know how unprofessional or lacking in skills, abilities, and knowledge they really are. So, well, we'll have part two of this discussion in, uh, in a later podcast once I've had an opportunity to, to read the, uh, the study. But I just found it quite interesting, that finding. That was, it was disconcerting because I thought we were breaking down those barriers. And while there is this minority issue that continually crops up in a variety of different industries and that kind of stuff, I thought we were kind of breaking that down. But I don't know. You know, we used to be pretty bad in this business. When I started in it a long time ago, there was very few people of color and, and not very many women at all. And that has certainly changed. I know I've been a member of Women in Aviation. I've been a supporter of them for, uh, well, it's almost 30 years, 20. Yeah, I'm a supporter as well, you know. I promote women all the time. You know, I have three daughters. I'm supporting them in other ways, too. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's a very expensive way, John. <laughs> in fact, I was just telling somebody today, I bought something at the store, and I gave them a $20 bill, and I got change back, and I said, I never knew you got change from a $20 bill. <laughs> yeah, well, I feel like a human ATM machine sometimes with my son up at college. So while it isn't as bad as what you have, it, uh, I do feel your pain, my friend. So It doesn't get any easier either. The, the older they get, the numbers just get bigger. I know. That's why I have to keep working because I got to pay for all of his bad habits. So yeah. it's crazy. And then, uh, of course, I ran across an article that I, I pushed off to you because we've been talking about pre-flights. We've been talking about maintenance and general aviation aircraft and things like that. And I thought this particular article prompted another good discussion point with regard to rental aircraft versus personally owned aircraft. And then, of course, decision making and making that right decision 
and I know that you read the article because we had a brief discussion about it. What were your initial thoughts? I didn't get that from you. So what were your initial thoughts when you read the article? Well, let's do the setup. So this individual rented an airplane that he had rented about five times previously. It was a short trip. It was only a a 70-mile trip from airport to airport, although he was going a little bit roundabout way and was going to add another 10 miles to the trip. And it's a V-tail bonanza. Right. So it was took off. It was uneventful. And en route, partway en route, I forget just how long he was in the air, not very long. And he was only a 250-hour pilot. But it, it wasn't in the air that long, and the engine quit. And so he set up the best glide. He looked around, and he found a field that looked like it could accommodate a landing in. And he cranked the gear down by hand. Because, of course, there's no hydraulics. He lost his engine. And he tried several attempts to get the engine started. And he was down to 1,200 feet when he got the engine started. And he was lined up at this field. And the engine started, and then it stopped. And then he tried it again, and he got it started. And this time, he just nursed it, the power up. He got enough power to sustain his altitude. At that time, was 1,000 feet or so. And... He was 10 miles from the airport, and he decided to go for it. Well, the 10 miles from the airport was over suburbia. It wasn't, you know, open fields. It was over housing developments and roads and power lines and all the things that we find in suburbia. And fortunately for him, he made it to the airport, and he did a dead stick landing at the airport. So all is well that ends well, but that's not the case, really. Because that decision-making can leave a lot to be desired. Fortunately for him, he had clear air, beautiful flying day, and the visibility was unlimited. So he could see, can imagine if that uh, had restrictions and visibility, never mind bad weather, what he would have done. He admits to being very nervous in his uh, after-action report. So he admits to be very nervous when the... Uh, when he lost the engine, and he had a passenger on board, too. Yeah, he had his son. And, you know, just reading this article, you know, he made a couple of statements after the fact, recounting and really questioning himself, thinking, man, he picked a field. He should have probably put the aircraft down in the field rather than once he got the engine kind of restarted because you don't know what's going on and you don't know how long that engine's going to run. And he's at a low altitude, 800 to a thousand feet. You're not going to glide very long. And if you're over some sort of populated area, your options for places to put the aircraft down safely are slim and none. And, you know, uh, our friend, Bob Hoover always said, you got to put the aircraft down in a place other than an airport, always fly it into the crash, if you will. Well, that means you have to be under control. That means you have to be able to control the aircraft. And this is a a perfect example. He also admitted, based on this article, that his decision-making may have been different if he had more, quote, experience, given the fact he only had 250 hours. But I'm not sure experience should factor into that decision. It's, I mean, we are all taught that in the, in the event of an engine failure, he started to do the right thing. He picked the best glide speed. He worked the issue. He tried to do a little troubleshooting, couldn't get it started. He committed himself because he cranked the gear down. So it's obvious that he selected a field and was committed to it and then tried to crank. And, you know, for whatever reason, the engine did, of course, fire again. But, I mean, that gave him, I think, a false sense of security that, okay, I got it started. Over real, you know, there it is. There's the airport. We're real close. Let's try and make it back. But like you said, John, if that engine, and it did quit over that area, fortunately, he had a little bit of altitude to, to get beyond that, that populated area. But this is the stuff that you and I harp on all the time. Every flying magazine out there, including Flying Magazine, but all the other publications are always talking about these kinds of events and the lessons learned. So 
why aren't people learning the lesson if we're always talking about it? Because this could have very easily turned into a very tragic accident because if you weren't able to get the engine restarted after it quit and you happen to be over an unsuitable place to try and land the airplane, a lot of pilots pull that yoke back into their lap trying to milk the distance only to run out of airspeed and altitude and they get into a loss of control. And that, of course, loss of control is the subject of the majority of general aviation accidents that are out there. There's a whole working group at the FAA and the industry trying to figure out loss of control. The NTSB has tried to figure out loss of control. And, you know, it's not something physical as it is mental. Yes. You know, and, and you touch upon a subject that has been really bugging me lately, and that is the safety data that we're using, you know, the NTSB and the FAA are focused on loss of control, loss of control, and as it pertains to the pilots. But the data that we're using, the coming out of the general aviation accidents that the NTSB looks at and the FAA looks at, I'm beginning to question the validity of that. And especially for the last year where the investigations have not been full-blown investigations. And for the life of me, I can't figure out why the powers to be at the NTSB, whether it be the chairman or the vice chairman who has strong general aviation credentials, haven't instructed the staff to start using some of the investigative talent that haven't been exercising their brain very much because they, the, you know, the Washington staff is typically the staff that goes to major accidents. They went to the Kobe crash, helicopter crash, which was a general aviation a 135 crash, and they sent a full team. They sent some really good talent on that one. And they've got this talent in Washington that's being underutilized. Why aren't we doing better investigations on the general aviation accident and maybe get some better data that may indicate something different than having every other accident be a con you know, loss of control by the pilot? Because there's selectivity process for what accidents they think need some sort of higher priority or more thorough and methodical investigation is flawed. They're trying to, you know, they're trying to use initial information to make the determination as to whether they launch on an accident or not. If you have a four fatal, the airplane hits a wire and you have a four fatal because of that wire strike, they're, they're writing it off, basically sending the FAA and doing that investigation from the office. Why? Because it was a wire strike. Yeah, okay, great. But how do you know what the cause of that wire strike was? Is it because the engine quit and the guy was trying to glide to an open field at night and he hit the wire? Is it because he was trying to show off to his friends and he was trying to fly under the wire, close to the wires? Or was he landing and there happened to be a wire that was unmarked at the end of the runway in a you know little grass strip that he had never been... I mean, how do you know unless you go out there and do your job as an investigator and ferret out all the facts, conditions, and circumstances? John, you and I are going to dissect a number of accidents with, uh, with our buddy Jason because I'm working two accidents right now that are going to be great case studies as soon as I get clearance to be able to do it because, I mean, the NTSB – on one of these events, if I didn't spend a lot of time explaining some of the issues in proper context, they would have definitely come out with a wrong probable cause. And we're working some issues right now with a couple of other model aircraft that we're hoping that they do the right thing. Because up until the point, and we've been working on these events since July of last year, up until this point, they have gone down the wrong path that big red easy button, they've been led like a bull with a ring in their nose down the wrong path because they aren't looking at all the facts, all the uh, conditions and circumstances. And a lot of it is because they're not going out. <laughs> they're not looking at the data. They're not doing the analysis that you would expect from an accident investigator. And we're going we're gonna to be hammering on this. I mean, I don't have a problem hammering on our old employer, John. Because if they were doing their job, we wouldn't be talking about them. 
but they aren't doing their job. And and this isn't just, you know, pet theory and and disgruntled employee. The last thing I am is a disgruntled employee. The thing I am pissed about is the fact that the quality of investigations has sorely been lacking. And we've got proof of it. Don't take our word for it. Read their investigations. You know, you can... <laughs> You can definitely figure out, okay, loss of control for unknown reason. There is always a reason for a loss of control. You can always develop enough information to get to a pretty good bottom line. You know, engine failure for unknown reason. Unless the the engine is totally obliterated, there is always a reason. And if we can find it, you know, through discovery and litigation – by you know doing a lot of post-accident testing and things that the board should be doing. Why is it that we can find it after the feds who have all the best resources and, and the most pristine evidence? Why can't they find it, but we can't? And it's, the will just isn't there, you know, and they cry resources and and there are reasons. There's sometimes legitimate reasons why they don't do it. But John, they're doing less accidents. When I first joined, when I joined the board back in 1980, we were doing 4,000 accidents a year. We were doing anything that flew, including a lawn chair with balloons, basically. But now they're very selective. They're doing, you know, less than 1,200 accidents a year. Yeah, that's the total. That's the total number. I mean, there's, I, I count over 300 uh, in 19, I mean, in 20, over 300 uh, accidents that they never went out for. They sent the FAA out. Exactly. And they have, what, 45, 50 investigators still. And they got a bigger budget. Yeah, it defies description. I wish they would just put some more, you know, instead of sending out one NTSB investigator, send out three or four to go do a little more in-depth, and maybe we'll find out that some of the assumptions that we've been making over over a long period of time Maybe not it be as accurate as we think. You know, one of my frustrations when I was there, and I haven't forgotten this, even though it's more than 20 years ago, but I was in the command center when, when a, an accident occurred, and one of our management types from a accident investigation was talking to, the, to a policeman on scene and asked him to walk over to the site and see if he smelled gasoline. And... You know, he was talking while he was walking, and you know, three or four minutes later, he said, I walked around the airplane, I can't smell any gasoline. So they put it down, it's running out of fuel. That's going to be in the, and and I got a little hot with my discussion with him over that. It didn't get very far, but it, I vented. John, you know, on a hot day in an arid place where the soil is, you know, bone dry, you can have, you know, 50 gallons of gas on that airplane, it's going to get soaked into the soil, you know, and if it's been sitting there for any period of time, unless you dig down to the first little layer of dirt, you're not going to smell fuel. That's right. I got to kick it open, you know, kick the tin can, so to speak. Yeah. So that gets entered into the database. And now if we, you know, get enough of those, we're going to skew the data to say we had stupid pilots that ran out of gas. And of course, Back when we were doing 1,800 to 2,000 accidents a year, the number of accidents attributed to running out of fuel was between five and 600. Now, now I wonder how many of those were inaccurate descriptions. I mean, that's the whole point. They should, you know, Bob Sumwell should take a period of time. For the next four weeks, we're going to send a team out of four people, whatever it is, and we're going to do in-depth on general aviation accidents to see what comes out of it. See if those findings differ from a similar four-week period or a similar number of crashes if the findings are different. And that may tell you that things are not as they appear, that you need to be doing something differently. Look, when I was there... I had a big concern about general aviation pilots and fatigue. One thing that we do very well in major investigations with our human performance folks in combination with the ops group is they go back and they do a systematic review of the pilot's 
you know, movements, their sleep patterns and everything else, we, we call it a 72 hour autopsy, basically looking back to see, you know, if there was a fatigue factor in a major investigation. How many pilots out there are using the aircraft for business? They go to work early in the morning. They work all day. They jump in the airplane in the afternoon, and they're shooting an approach down to minimums, you know, at 9 o'clock, 10 o'clock at night. They're already tired getting into the airplane because they worked all day. And we, <laughs> I got a feeling if we were to go back and look at a lot of these accidents where pilots have, have shot an approach and screwed it all up late at night, uh, you know, and without having looked back at what did they do the whole day, I think a lot of them would have a fatigue factor in it. And that's why I agree with you that, I mean, we got to do a better job. Everybody wants to know this loss of control, and they're trying to find some quantitative or qualitative information. Well, that's great. You're sure as hell not going to get it from the statistics at the NTSB and maybe not even the FAA. Because a lot of the information has not been ferreted out. When I did a special study on the Mitsubishi MU2, I pulled all the accidents and incidents that were in the NTSB's database. I actually went, uh, I pulled information from other foreign authorities that had investigated MU2 accidents. I got all the information from Mitsubishi on each one of these accidents that they were tracking. You know how long it took me, and I had a colleague working with me because she was able to do some word searching, but you couldn't get the good stuff out of the probable cause statement or the, the contributing factors because they screwed it all up. You'd read the narrative, the factual narrative, and there would be stuff in the factual narrative that wasn't reflected in the probable cause statement or the causal factors, and then I'm thinking, why did they write a safety recommendation? You got some great stuff here. So they were very incomplete. The fidelity of the information, especially if it was uh, like an MU2 that ran off the side of the runway because the pilot landed long or whatever, it was so generic that because the fidelity in the, the report wasn't there, it was hard to track any kind of statistics. I mean, they didn't find out what kind of training the pilot had. They really didn't capture how much experience he had or she had in the aircraft versus a simulator or some training environment. So now, you, I mean, all the data was really skewed, and it took me a very long time to ferret out that data. I had to go to other sources. So I agree. If we're going to try and solve this loss of control issue, which I don't think we ever will because as long as you have humans involved – who knows uh, you know, what they're going to come up with. But I agree that in order for us to get some very good information, you got to have very good investigations so that we can learn from those investigations, the minute details. That's really where the solution lies, is in those little minute details that people just seem to blow off. It's frustrating, John, and we talk about it on a regular basis on this show. But again, I mean, it's just very frustrating. And in another issue with this particular accident that we were talking about is a maintenance event. I know that you brought this up with regard to the maintenance, and apparently this was a rental aircraft. Yes, and many times in the, in the manuals for GA aircraft, they don't specify hard times for things like fuel filters. They may say change it annually, but if the airplane's flown a lot, you really need to be doing it more often than that. And it assumes that you have uh, good fuel all the time, not contaminated with it, uh, dirt. You know, so the tank issue comes to uh, the forefront. What kind of fuel, what kind of trucks do you have it in? Are you pumping directly from a tank with a gas pump like a gas station? like many small airports have. I mean, there's so many factors into it. You know, do you have a mechanic that didn't do his work, didn't do the job, and said he did, falsifying the records? I, you know, he needs to be hung, take his license away from him. But, you know, there's so many issues in rental airplanes because they have so many different pilots People don't write up what they find because they think that they don't, the rental company doesn't want them to write it up, or they know their buddy's going to come out and take it next, and they don't want to 
deny him a, a day flying. Who knows what the reasons are, unless we go in and ask the questions. Or somebody thinks that, well, if I write it up, then they'll think I broke it. <laughs> and they don't want to be responsible for it. Yep, that too. You know, I, I've owned a number of airplanes that I've had on lease back in flight schools. And of course, I am an aircraft owner and have been for a very long time. But I still rent airplanes, and I am guilty of the fact that do I have a lot of tacit trust in the aircraft provider? Yes, unfortunately, sometimes I do. It's either because I know them too well, or I get a little lazy, and I want to go fly rather than do those things, like make sure that, I mean, I do see, I check the board to make sure that you know, the aircraft is in annual and, and things are, are, are properly timed. But, you know, I don't go into all the records or at least the last, you know, several months of records, uh, maintenance records to see if there were any issues that needed to be fixed. I try to, when I have a pilot come out of an airplane, and, you know, I basically will say everything good on the airplane. And, you know, either yeah, it is or no, it isn't. And if you watch airline crews, you'll see. That is the crew getting off the airplane meets the crew getting on the airplane. They'll either say, you know, you got a good airplane or no, we had to write this up or whatever. That transference of information is valuable because if you get a pilot, you know, flying a 172 says, yeah, I was flying the airplane. But, you know, it, I heard a grinding noise in the control yoke. Well, I think that, you know, if I heard a grinding noise in the control yoke, it's probably a bearing of some sort. I might want to have somebody look at it before I go take it, because if I'm up there flying and that thing gets hung up or jammed, I'm kind of out of luck. <laughs> so it is a good exercise that if you are a renter of an aircraft, because you do put tacit trust that the facility that is renting the aircraft the maintenance is being done. It's being done thoroughly and properly. And that just because they say, yep, the airplane's good to go, doesn't necessarily mean it's good to go. We've talked about this with the fact that even aircraft owners, there are guys that love the, the perception. You know, they own an aircraft and they love the fact that they could say, yeah, I own an airplane. But they don't put a dollar into it to keep it well up to date with maintenance or anything else you and i go to a lot of little airports how many airplanes have we seen sitting out there rotting oh many 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 yeah and, and it's heartbreaking because our listeners i'm sure you go to any airport we all know the guy who owns an airplane and you know the paint's all worn out the tires are all cracked and they're out there flying this bag of bolts if you will and, you know, they do whatever it takes not to put money into it. They'll do enough maintenance or do what it takes to fix a, quote, problem. And that's it. You know, and this issue with this particular airplane was a fuel filter that was clogged. Now, when a fuel filter starts to clog up, it gets restricted fuel. One of the ways that it manifests itself that tells you, that, hey, dummy, there's something going on, is if you push the throttle forward quickly, or pull it back quickly, depending on your installation, and the engine doesn't accelerate, it sort of stalls, and then it catches up and, and runs, that's telling you that there's a restriction in the fuel someplace. Could be the carburetor or injectors, or it could be the fuel filter. That needs to be written up, and it needs to be looked at. I would venture to say that the people that rented this airplane before this guy, maybe several flights before this guy, may have had a problem with an engine that gave them a little bit of slow reaction and never said a word about it. Yep. I know. And again, that's why it, you, you can't put all of your eggs in one basket when it comes to rental aircraft. I mean, there are very reputable organizations out there that... You know, I trust them implicitly. But again, when it comes to making sure that when you rent that aircraft, you're renting an airworthy airplane, it's up to you, the pilot in command. Because guess what the Federal Aviation Regulations say? That regardless of the guy who turned the wrench on it or the operator who hands you the keys and rents you that airplane, the final authority determining whether or not that aircraft is in a, in a condition for safe operation 
is the pilot in command. And you need to make sure that you exercise that authority to its fullest extent. Because if something happens, they're not going to the operator. They're not going to the mechanic. They're coming to you first. (laughs) Hopefully you've survived the event. Yeah, they'll go to the mechanic eventually if it was a mechanical issue. But yes, they'll go right down the line. Rental airplanes also bring up my other favorite subject about doing an adequate pre-flight. Because it's a rental airplane, the pilot going out to take it should do the most detailed pre-flight inspection he knows how to do. Because you just don't know. Too many hands in the soup. How's that saying going? Too many hands spoil the soup or something? (laughs) I forget. But, you know, too Too many many cooks in the kitchen. Yeah. Yep. So if you got that many people flying the airplane, different people, who knows what the condition is? You've got to make sure you go the extra mile and make sure that everything on your end, that everything you can check is checked to make sure. You know, my one of my favorite things is when you move the flight controls, you shouldn't just go out there and move them up and down fast. You should move them very slow to see if you can feel any resistance, any snapping. Same thing with the rudder. In fact, I just saw a, a video that somebody t- had taken of an airplane, and when they moved the stabilator, the rudder jerked just a little bit. The rudder moved just a little bit when they moved the stabilator. Well, it's telling me that something's rubbing inside that airplane someplace. It needs to be looked at. Yeah. You know, the one thing that I equate it to a lot, John, is, you know, we drive our car every day. I know my car like the back of my hand. I know what sounds normal. I know what feels normal, whether it's pushing on the accelerator and the expected acceleration or when I push the brake. Hmm, is that stiff or is it a little spongy? You get to know these little things about your particular car. Well, the same thing with an airplane. And if you're renting an airplane, you don't have the ability to to really get that tacit feel and and understanding of that particular airplane. And that's why it really is critical to be plugged in to the little things when you take an airplane that one, you either haven't flown, period, or even if you have flown it on a a regular basis, so is 25 other people. And it's like, that's why people don't buy rental cars. I would never buy a rental car because I know what I do to a rental car. I sure as heck don't treat it the same way I treat my personal car. Well, it's a renter airplane. You know, you don't have standardization amongst the the kid that has 15 hours of total time versus, you know, the guy that has 500 hours who's a weekend warrior who rents that airplane. They fly it totally different. That aircraft takes different types of abuse. And so that's why it's really important to stay plugged in with the little things because it's not a, a wing falling off necessarily or the tail coming off that's going to hurt you or kill you it's going to be those little things it's going to be like you were talking about that little grinding that says something's rubbing and the potential for it to get jammed and things like that or there's just a little hiccup in the engine when you're doing a mag check you know it it, yeah it's still within the acceptable range but it didn't sound the way it normally should sound or it didn't feel the way it normally would feel Those are the little signs that if you catch them early, that's the difference between, you know, having to use your extraordinary skills or enjoying the flight that you had. Yes. Well, I think we beat that subject to death. Yep. No, that's why I always like talking to you because we can can beat these subjects to death and hopefully our listeners are getting something out of it because we try to bring up you know, different perspectives. And again, it's the, it's the little things. You and I have done enough accident investigations to know that the sequence of events are a sequence of small things, uh, you know, improper decisions. And while in the grand scheme of things, yeah, that improper decision led to a big event. The fact is, is that it's this combination of a variety of different things that ends up resulting in a serious incident or accident. So hopefully, our listeners get uh, get some benefit from it. And of course, we get the benefit from our listeners with regard to your, your feedback, your suggestions, your ideas. And I know that we were going to talk about some of the emails in this particular show, 
But of course, John and I get off on our tangent and we start beating things into the ground sometimes. And we don't like to stop in the middle. So we will pick up on our uh, on our listeners' emails in our next show so that we can address uh, some of these emails because they were very good. They did provide good suggestions. They did have good questions and comments that uh, we think that uh, would benefit the listeners in sharing some of these things. So we promise we will uh, we will do that. So keep the emails coming. You can always get a hold of us through our email at flight safety detectives with an s at gmail.com and of course john and i read all those emails and comments coming in and so of course not only do we try to respond to them directly to the person writing that email but again we're going to talk about some of these because we find them some of them are very entertaining some of them are very informative and then of course the questions that are asked definitely make you and I not only think, but have to do a little bit of research. So we do appreciate that. So again, thank you very much for that feedback. And I know, John, that, uh, you know, the beach is calling your name and so is a mojito. So with that, my friend, I will give you the last word. Well, I have a couple last words. And that is one, just remind everybody, if you need to have any insurance, Renew your insurance, buy a new airplane insurance, if you're a flying club, whatever the reason, if you need insurance, to give Avemco a call. And the number again is 888-879-0389. Mention Flight Safety Detectives and get yourself a 5% discount. And please, the pandemic is not behind us. Please wear a mask, wash your hands, take care of yourself. And no, don't get sick and don't spread the sickness. And if you go flying, please pay attention to detail. Do a good walk around. Make sure you have enough gas on board. Do the right thing. Don't rush it. Because we don't want to lose any listeners. We want you to come back. So please fly safe. To listen to more episodes of the show, go to FlightSafetyDetectives.com or the Professional Aviation Maintenance Association at PAMA.org and wherever you find your favorite podcasts. Catch us next time when John Golia and Greg Fife talk about all things aviation. Thanks for listening.